Hey everybody, welcome back to History Student Reacts. Today we'll be watching Justinian and Theodora Part 5, Impossible Burden of Fate by Extra History. So, last time we saw Belisarius, Justinian's general, reconquering Roman North Africa. And for his achievement, he was granted a triumph, a military parade that, at this time in Roman history, was almost exclusively reserved for the emperors themselves. Today, we're going to see Belisarius as he begins to reconquer Roman Italy. Now, before we get into this one, I'd appreciate it if you guys would leave a like, subscribe, and check out my Patreon. It is linked down below. Now, with all of that out of the way, let's jump right into this reaction. Dawn rises on Constantinople. A few men sweep the streets, clearing what remains of yesterday's triumph. Belisarius has restored Africa to the Empire. Justinian has restored Africa to the Empire. Mm -hmm. The glory of Rome grows. Justinian's great cathedral grows from old ashes. All memory of the violent days of Nika are just that now, memories. Where once there were the scars of fire, there's now marble and gold. His city is triumphant, but still he is awake at dawn. Something's not finished, something's left undone. He has brought order where there was none. He's made justice the province of all men. He has worked to heal the faith and toppled a heretical king. He's brought <laughs> riches to the empire, brought pride to the army. He's even made peace with the East. And yet for all this, one thought haunts him. One thought keeps him from Theodora's bed. The city of Rome is not part of the Roman Empire. Sunrise after sunrise. Yeah, I mean, look, at this point, Rome itself was not such an important city militarily or even politically but as a symbol, it was extremely important, right? It still had that legacy, that history. And so it was something that was very attractive to Justinian. You know, even during the empire, in the last years of the empire, Rome had essentially no longer been the capital of the Western Roman Empire. It was too deep inside Roman territory. Several other capitals closer to the other provinces were used, because this was a time when the empire was in chaos and emperors needed to be able to respond quickly whenever problems would arise, as they constantly did. So Rome had sort of been in decline for a long time. It was not the city it once was. But, like I said, that symbol was still there. Everyone knew what Rome meant, what it symbolized, its legacy, its history. I mean, it was the start of all of this, the beginning of the Roman Empire, so it was still very important in that sense. As pass like this, each day he greets the dawn still awake from the night's toil. He labors for his city and for his people, and yet he's a Roman emperor without Rome. Then one day he's greeted by a message. As he reads its words, anger and joy war within him, and over it all he can't help but wonder at the remarkable nature of all things. He'd kept his friend Belisarius in the city. He'd even made him a consul to acknowledge his service while he waited for new orders. Justinian knew one day he'd give the com Consul. At one time, the two consuls were the lead executives of Rome. Uh, but for a long, long time, and I mean hundreds of years, it had just been a position given out as a sort of ceremonial honor. You know, it's interesting to see because the Roman Empire lasted for such a long time, you see these institutions and positions that lasted for hundreds, you know, if not a thousand plus years, and you see how they changed over time, you know, what they meant, you know, from one period to another. And oftentimes these institutions and these positions could mean very different things if you're looking at Rome, God, I don't know, in the year 300 B.C., versus something like 1000 AD. I mean, you're talking about essentially a completely different empire. But, of course, those changes were all incremental, right? They all happened over this very long span of time. Command and Belisarius would sail towards the setting sun to restore the Western Roman Empire. But the time was never right. The Ostrogoths who currently ruled Italy were friends of his Rome, and their queen had even tried to raise her son like a Roman. He couldn't just declare war on their neighbors and friends, but- Right, well, it's worth talking about the state of the Ostrogothic kingdom in the West. So, the West, 
fell in 476, right? That is our official date for the fall of the Western Roman Empire. Though, as I've said, it's a, it was more of a process than a single event. A lot of the things that characterized the fall of Rome were already in motion before that year, and a lot of the institutions of Rome would continue afterwards. So you have Odoacer, an Ostrogothic king, who deposed Romulus Augustulus, the, the last emperor of the Western Empire. Um, and then he was defeated by another Ostrogoth, uh, Theodoric, known as Theodoric the Great, who would go on to rule for another couple decades, uh, up until, uh, I think, 526, which is, I think, the year before Justinian took power. So we're, we're getting a little bit of crossover here. The thing about Odoacer, and Theodoric especially, is that they essentially ruled as client kings of Rome. You know, they ruled through a lot of the same institutions that the Roman emperors had ruled through, and they ruled with the sort of nominal approval of Eastern Rome. Now, obviously, Eastern Rome wasn't thrilled about the situation, but they were willing to keep this, you know, sort of, you could call it a farce, but this situation going where these Ostrogoths ruled, and they ruled autonomously, but they ruled essentially on behalf of Rome, the Roman Empire. Um, some people even describe Theodoric uh, as sort of another Western emperor. Now, you know, officially that was not the case, but he did sort of effectively rule this territory similarly to how it had been ruled previously. And like I said, he ruled it as sort of a client king of Rome. You know, he they still had to deal with you know, each of these men had, you know, their sort of Roman entourage, and then they had their Ostrogothic entourage, and they had to sort of pander to both, and, you know, make sure that they weren't falling afoul of either. It's sort of a bit of a split responsibility, honestly. Uh, they had different interest groups to look after, um, and they were not, by the books, Roman emperors, and there was a difference between them and prior Roman emperors, of course, um... But you had this relationship between this Ostrogothic kingdom and the Roman Empire as it survived in the East. So that is sort of the state of things, you know, as Justinian takes over. Uh, you know, Theodoric the Great, his time is up. That's sort of where we jump into this. And those sort of friendly relations, complicated, but sort of friendly relations continue into his reign. Uh, up until a certain point, of course. But he knew it would be his legacy to bring the Eternal City, to bring the birthplace of the Empire back into the Empire itself. And now in his hand, he had it. His key to the ancient city, the birthplace of Scipio and Caesar and Augustus. It came with a price, though. The Queen of the Ostrogoths, the legitimate heir of their country, was dead, mm -hmm. strangled in her bath. She had been a friend of Justinian's. She had once even asked if she could take asylum in his court if she ever had to flee. And now she was dead, overthrown by a cousin who thought she was too Roman. But her Hey, like I said, th there was this sort of dynamic where if you're an Ostrogothic ruler, you know, you're ruling over a Roman population with these Roman institutions, sort of this Italian Roman population. But you're also ruling over your Ostrogothic subjects. And especially in the halls of power, there are a lot of Ostrogoths, especially in the military. And so you have to make sure that you can appeal to both. And clearly in this case, some people uh, saw her as, as a little too Roman. You know, she didn't appeal to the Ostrogoths enough. Her death would bring him Rome, because now at last he has an excuse for war. He would bring vengeance and restoration of a rightful rule. But part of him has to laugh. He remembers how a few short years ago the same exact events had played out with the Vandals to give him back Africa. It has to be a sign. He tosses aside the crumpled note. It's time to ready the ships of war. Belisarius stands before his fleet. His emperor, his friend Justinian, has commanded him to sail on Italy. He paces back and forth, inspecting his men. A mere 7,500 men with which he has to conquer all of Italy. Yeah, I mean, we saw he managed to conquer Vandal North Africa with more men. Um... And that was certainly a challenge. You know, that was not a piece of cake. At a certain point, Belisarius almost walked himself into a trap. So this is quite the monumental task that has been laid in front of him. This is absolutely not going to be easy. 
it'll definitely be more difficult, especially in the long run, than retaking North Africa. That's barely half what he'd had in Africa, and even that victory had been a miracle. He knows the legions are stretched thin. They have to garrison the new provinces, as well as manage the many other borders of the Empire, but 7,500 men? That's impossible. He straps on his helmet. If his friend and emperor command, he will do the impossible again. <laughs> After weeks of waiting- I mean, hey, if anybody could, it would be Belisarius. For word from Belisarius, a courier finally arrives. Justinian tears the seal from the parchment, and as he reads, a smile crosses his lips. Belisarius had sailed to Sicily, and town after town had surrendered to him. Only Panormus had defied the might of Rome, and there Belisarius had done what Belisarius did best. The Ostrogoths defending Panormus had pulled back to the city, abandoning the countryside and trusting to their walls to keep the small Roman force out. Belisarius had known he couldn't afford to get bogged down in a siege, and he didn't have enough men to storm the town. For most commanders, this would have doomed the campaign. A delay here would have, at the very least, bought the Ostrogoths time to bring reinforcements from the mainland. But Belisarius had simply pulled his ships into the undefended harbor and ordered his men to climb the masts. From atop the masts, <laughs> they had poured down a hail of arrows oh, upon wow. the exposed defenders, driving them from the walls and allowing the Romans to take the city. Justinian's smile grows. All is going according to plan. He had sent money to the Franks in far-off Gaul to have them invade Italy from the west, while another of his forces pushed in toward Italy from the east. The usurper king of Rome had sent envoys, at first offering to acknowledge Justinian's rule of Sicily, and then, in the latest round of talks, apparently offering all of Italy so long as he himself was spared. Justinian's Roman Empire would be whole again soon. <laughs> Meanwhile, Belisarius stands upon the walls of Panormus, looking to the north. He can see the coast of Italy from the walls. The messengers have brought him nothing but bad news. In the east, the Roman forces had withdrawn when their commander fell in a recent battle. Even worse, he was also being called back to Africa. The troops he'd left there were in revolt. If he doesn't sail for Carthage right away, all they had won in Africa might be lost. Hey, nothing is ever simple. Think about the last couple hundred years of Roman history, and that is the history of an empire besieged on all sides and internally constantly. Those in charge, the military, hopping from problem to problem, putting out fire after fire after fire. Now, you know, the Eastern Roman Empire has been shrunk down, which has made it, I mean, from the unified Roman Empire, we're dealing with less territory, which has made it a little more manageable. Though, frankly, over time, the Eastern Roman Empire will have the same issue, being besieged on all sides. But the point is, you're now retaking some of this territory, you were going to face with the exact same problems. What, you think you can march in, take this territory back, and all's going to be good? Nope, there's going to be a lot of problems popping up, as always. Italy will have to wait. Rage. Rage is Justinian's only emotion. Italy was in his grasp. He was a few signatures away from retaking the heart of the empire, and now that chance is gone. The Ostrogothic usurper imprisoned his envoys and rejected all previous offers when he heard of Belisarius' delay and the retreat of the Roman army marching through Dalmatia. Justinian's chance for a quick, clean victory is lost. Now the heartland will have to be won by fire and sword. As he pens a letter to Belisarius, Justinian cannot help but think of what he's going to do to this so-called Ostrogothic king. <laughs> the world will know, you do not imprison the ambassadors of Rome. Yeah, well, he maybe should have taken a cue from his predecessors, right? We talked about how several of these Ostrogothic kings, these Ostrogothic leaders, had ruled autonomously, but had still pledged some sort of fealty to the Eastern Roman Empire. I mean, the only reason this is happening, the cause is belly for Justinian, is that that status quo was overthrown. Now, even if it hadn't been, Justinian probably would have found a way to get his forces back in there and take over, but you've had this relationship that has worked out pretty well between the Ostrogoths and the remaining Roman Empire in the East, and you want to upset that balance? Okay then, I guess we'll see what's going to happen. After returning from Carthage, Belisarius had landed at Regium and moved north along the Italian coast. The Italians were far less inviting than the African subjects of Rome, but still, city after city threw open its gates and his forces marched unopposed at least until they reached Neapolis. He had ordered his army to set up camp outside its walls. That had been 20 days ago. Now he weighs his options. He could abandon the siege and see if he could make it to Rome and perhaps get reinforcements from Constantinople while there. But no, leaving a strong enemy garrison behind him can't be the right choice. He simply doesn't have enough men. 
At every town and city along the way, he'd have to leave a garrison to maintain control. And now you're just dealing with such limited resources and manpower, right? Ideally, you have enough men to take this territory and garrison these enemy towns and forts. But Belisarius doesn't have enough men. He just doesn't. And so you're left with the difficult situation of, okay, what do I do then? Do I march past these enemy strongholds, leaving them, you know, ready to attack us as we march forward? That's not a good option either, but you're left in a really precarious situation, you know, the whole between a rock and a hard place, essentially. And now his force was barely large enough to encircle the city. Hmm. There was movement by his tent, one of his soldiers. Sir, one of the barbarian mercenaries has something to tell you. He waves over the man, who says, I was looking over the aqueducts, I never saw anything like it. And by barbarian, of course, we're speaking from the Roman perspective, and barbarian essentially means anybody but us. Maybe a couple of exceptions. I always think there's there was a degree of respect between the Romans and their eternal rivals, the Persians, but... Rome basically looked at, like, all other people surrounding them and said, All right, you're all barbarians. <laughs> and now that we broke them and they're all dry, I figured I'd poke around a bit and see how they were made. I found a pipe, sir. A waterway that, if we enlarged the opening a bit, could fit a man. He doesn't waste a minute. He sends orders to his officers. Get your men. Hey, Have Belisarius knows a good opportunity when he sees it, and he's ready to seize on it. Then prepare to attack the far wall. Tell them to make a lot of noise, and tell them not to die. Five of you, grab chisels and follow Don't this die. man here. As Belisarius' men attack the walls, shouting and beating their shields, but never really coming close enough to encounter a serious risk, his small force of- <laughs> Me as a general. Alright, y'all are gonna go over there and, uh, don't die, alright? That's your orders. <laughs> Engineers widen the entry to the pipe, their hammers and chisels drowned out by the diversion. Soon, Belisarius is given word. It's done. They can enter the city by cover of night. The pipe leads straight through the walls. He calls for a messenger and quickly pens a note to the leadership of Neapolis. Please surrender now. I have a way into your city. And I'm afraid I won't be able to keep my barbarian mercenaries from sacking your city if we have to take it by force. I'll try to hold them back, but I don't think there's much I can do. Justinian is smiling again. It's such a, it's kind of a funny dynamic. You are in territory controlled by barbarians, the Ostrogoths, and you're besieging a city that is probably full of, you know, Romans, essentially, no longer under the control of the Roman Empire, but Romans, Roman civilians. So you, a Roman, are besieging a Roman city, but the territory is controlled by Ostrogoths, and your threat is, hey, I can't control my barbarians here. They might. It's, sort of, it's such a weird dynamic, though it's very characteristic of... Frankly, a lot of the Roman Empire, but especially those last couple hundred years when barbarians, you know, and of course, like I said, that meant essentially a lot of people and it could change over time. Like, you know, you go backwards and at one point Gauls were extremely foreign, scary barbarians, but then they were integrated into the Roman political and military structure. Near the end of the empire, it was the Germanic peoples that were the sort of barbarian types. But they had become so, like, integrated into the military structure. And then you also had sort of auxiliary forces of Ostrogoths and Visigoths and Vandals. That you had a lot of these sort of odd dynamics happening with this sort of over overarching Roman Empire. And a lot of Roman civilians, but then a lot of different groups of people working against each other, with each other, you know at times on different sides, at times on the same side, you know, alliances can be made and broken very quickly and with a bit of gold handed out. And even, you know, after the fall of the West, with Justinian reconquering these territories, you can still see a bit of that there. Again, Neapolis is taken and Belisarius is on his way to Rome. It really is a pity that the Hunnish troops had looted and pillaged Neapolis for a full day before Belisarius could get them under control. It might make the rest of the campaign more difficult. People might not be so eager to open their gates. Still, just in the end- Yeah, I mean, we talked about how in North Africa, Belisarius went on a kind of hearts and minds approach. He tried to win the trust and loyalty of the people in the territory he was reconquering, right? His approach was, well, you guys are Roman civilians. This is territory that belongs to us. We're just taking it back. And so you'll be treated fairly and, you know, I'll try to prevent my troops from misbehaving. Now, we're encountering a little more resistance here, so that is 
not happening as much. You know, there's a bit of a struggle, especially in this instance. But to my understanding, broadly, Belisarius kept that same approach when taking back Italy. He continued to take the approach that these were Roman civilians, and thus they should be treated as Roman civilians, uh, not as sort of enemy combatants or enemy civilians. Can't help but be amused by his friend. For all of Belisarius' cleverness, he could be shockingly naive. Apparently, it never occurred to him that people might be suspicious of a note politely asking them to surrender. But it doesn't matter now, because there's but one objective left. Ahead of them is Rome. Mm -hmm. That's the big one. That's, uh, that's what they want back. I mean, they want all the territory back. But as we said, Rome has got that special symbolic importance. It's not the most important military outpost in Italy. Absolutely not. But it's important for other reasons. And, I mean, one of those reasons, of course, is, uh, you know, religion, right? I mean, the we don't have the Orthodox Catholic split at this point, but, and this was kind of the case from almost the beginning, there is tension between the East and the West, Eastern and Western Christians, and Rome is one of those centers, sort of the center of Western Christendom, even at this point, though the, the split, um, well, the official split hasn't happened, but the, it's even the tension is far less pronounced than it will be. But Rome is a very important city religiously, and of course that's only going to increase as the years go on, and the West and the East you know, grow further and further apart, and then you eventually have the official split. Uh, but even at this point, Western uh, Rome is an important city for Western Christendom. Uh, so yeah, uh, another interesting episode. I hope you guys enjoyed this one. If you did, I'd appreciate it if you'd leave a like, subscribe, and check out my Patreon. It is linked down below. Now, I hope you guys are all having a good day today, and I hope to see you all for the next episode. Uh, I'll see you all again next time. Goodbye.